Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on Sysloop ligand gated ion channels. In this video, what we're going to talk about is GABA A receptor mutations and uh, their involvement in um, epilepsy, basically. GABA A receptor mutations and epilepsy. So, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by discussing the importance of GABA-A receptors uh, in uh, the uh, central nervous system. Okay, we're then going to talk about the structure of the GABA-A receptor, and finally we'll see uh, how mutations in the GABA-A receptor subunits, and that should say GABA-A receptor, let me get rid of that, uh, mutations, uh, can lead to uh, epilepsy. Okay. Uh, so we're going to look at three uh, forms of epilepsy which are associated with uh, mutations in the GABA-A receptors. Uh, and these are childhood absence seizures. Then we've got uh, generalized epilepsy uh, with, fe sorry, with febrile seizures, GEFs. And then finally we've got severe myoclonic epilepsy of infant infancy, uh, SMEI. Schmei. Okay, right, so we'll start off by looking at the role of the GABA-A receptor in the central nervous system. We'll then look at the structure of the GABA-A receptor, and then finally what we'll do is discuss these three forms of epilepsy and give a little bit of detail into what they cause. Right, okay. So let's start off with the role of the GABA-A receptor in the central nervous system because only by looking at the role of the GABA-A receptor in the central nervous system can we understand why mutations in the GABA-A receptor lead to epilepsy. Okay, so uh, let's draw a neuron here. Okay, so this is our neuron here. So basically, uh, GABA receptors are receptors for the amino acid gamma amino butyric acid. Okay, and let me just draw the structure of this amino acid in a moment. Okay, so I'll abandon my picture of a neuron, and I'll just start by um, explaining the uh, ligand for the GABA-A receptor. So GABA, it stands for gamma amino butyric acid. So this is gamma, the Greek letter gamma, amino uh, butyric acid. Now, butyric acid is the old name for butanoic acid. So it means a carboxylic acid which has four carbons. So here's the carboxylic acid head here. Then we've got three more carbons off here. One, two, three. Okay, so that gives us overall four carbons. And then we need to factor in the fact that this is gamma amino butyric acid. So it needs a amino group of the gamma carbon. Now, the way you label the carbons in a carboxylic acid is the first carbon of the carboxylic acid group over here. So this one is labeled the alpha carbon. The carbon along from that is labeled the beta carbon. And then finally, this one over here is labeled the gamma carbon. So the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. So we need an amino group of this gamma carbon over here. So here's our amino group. Then, off all of these carbons, you'll then have hydrogens. Okay, so this is the structure of gamma amino butyric acid, or GABA. And you can see why it's an amino acid, uh, because it's got an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. Now, you might argue, um, well, it's not a proteinergic amino acid, because proteinergic amino acids only have one carbon in between the amino and the carboxylic acid group. And I'll say you're quite correct, it's not a proteinergic amino acid, uh, but it is still an amino acid. To be an amino acid, you don't have to only have one carbon in between the amino group and the carboxylic acid group. You just have to have the amino group and the carboxylic acid group, as this molecule does. So, this is the ligand for the GABA-A receptor. So, now let's continue with our picture of this neuron to see what GABA does when it's released onto a neuron. Okay, so here's our basic picture of the neuron. So, we have the cell body here with the nucleus at the centre. Okay, so this is the soma of the neuron, uh, which is the fancy word for cell body. So, this is equal to the cell body of the neuron. And then we have the axon, uh, which um, 
tr which comes off the cell body, and then at the end of the axon, you'll have the axon terminal. So this is the axon. This end portion here, this is known as the axon terminal. And then finally, the inputs to this neuron come in through these processes that come off the uh, cell body, and these processes extending off the cell body of the neuron, these are known as the dendrites or the dendritic processes. So these are dendrites. Right, so this neuron will have other neurons synapsing onto it. So now let's draw one of these other neurons synapsing onto it. So here's the axon terminal of some other neuron over here. Okay, so I will only draw this end portion of it. So you imagine we've just taken a bit of, well, we've just taken the end bit of another neuron, and we're not drawing the whole neuron. We've just taken the axon terminal with the uh, end portion of the axon attached to the axon terminal. Right, and let's say this presynaptic neuron here wants to uh, inhibit this postsynaptic neuron. Okay, well, what it can do is it can release GABA into this synapse here. So it can release the gamma aminobutyric acid shown here into the synapse. So we'll denote this with a little bit of color. So these little red dots are going to denote the GABA. Okay, right. Now, how does the GABA actually inhibit the postsynaptic neuron? What well, acts through GABA A receptors, which are in the membrane of uh, this postsynaptic cell? So let's study this in a bit more detail. So uh, the GABA A receptor, for now what we'll do is we'll just draw the GABA A receptor in our sort of archetypal uh, ion channel manner, okay? So we'll draw it like so. So we'll study its structure in a bit more detail in a moment, but for now we'll just draw it as a box with a hole down the middle, a tube down the middle through which ions can move. Now. Basically, when GABA diffuses across the synaptic cleft to the postsynaptic membrane, what will happen is the GABA molecules will bind uh, to this GABA receptor here, this GABA A receptor specifically. Okay, and two GABA molecules need to bind to each GABA A receptor in order to make it open. And I'm just going to discuss the um, states that the GABA A receptor can exist in for a moment. So basically, you have the closed state for the receptor. So I'll show this here. Okay, so this is the closed state of the GABA A receptor, where uh, it doesn't allow ions to move. And it's a little bit of an extreme drawing, basically. Um, the pore isn't completely uh, non-existent, as I've sh shown in this drawing, but it gets the message across that this is a closed channel. Okay, so this is closed and we put a forward slash resting. Now this means that if the ligand binds to this state, it will open. So that's why we put the closed resting. We're going to see that there's another closed state which is not the closed resting state. So now what's going to happen is our uh, GABA is going to be released on our GABA A receptor and two GABA molecules are going to bind to our GABA A receptor here. Okay, so here are the GABA molecules bound to our GABA A receptors, and that causes uh, the receptor to go from the closed resting state to the open state. Okay, and the thing which prompts this transformation is ligand binding. Okay, now let's look at what happens next. So, you can go back to the closed resting state if the GABA is to fall off. However, if the GABA remains bound, the channel will not just remain in the open state forever. It will remain open for a while, a certain amount of time, and then it will close. Okay, And it doesn't go back into the closed resting state, because to be in the closed resting state, it has to have no uh, GABA bound to it. So it goes into a different state. And this is the closed desensitized state. So this is a different state, basically. Although I've drawn the same picture, it's very different. The actual a uh, state that the receptor is in is very different, okay? But it, it has the same effect of closing the pore of the channel and blocking ions from moving through. So this over here is the closed desensitized state where the ligand is still bound, but the receptor 
is um, closed. Okay, so this prevents overstimulation of the cell. Well, over conductance, basically. It means that the receptor will bind to the ligand and will remain open for a certain amount of time and then it will close. So it means that the receptor is only allowing current into the cell uh, for a transient period of time. Okay, so the amount of time that it remains open before turning into the closed desensitized state isn't set. It will vary from receptor to receptor and it will vary from time to time, so the same receptor will not always take uh, the same amount of time to close. It's a probabilistic event. So there's a mean time, however. So this is this mean time that you are open for is then known as the mean open time. So you stay open for a certain amount of time, and the average amount of time you remain open is known as the mean open time, and then you go into this closed desensitized state. Okay, right. So... Um, We'll continue this discussion in the next video.